Good morning and happy Easter to those of you gathered here for worship at Second Presbyterian Church in Portsmouth, Ohio. Good morning to those of you who are listening on WIOI this morning and hello to those of you who are watching the live stream with us or perhaps catching up with the service later on today or later this week. My name is Allison Bauer and I'm the pastor here at Second Pres and I'm glad to share the leadership of this worship service with our director of music, Dr. Stan Workman and the chancel choir and all of the special guest musicians we have with us this morning. Uh, Cody, John, Nicholas, Grant, Chrissy, Grant, oop, no, I said Grant twice, and Mike, who are joining us in the choir loft for this very festive occasion. Boy, everybody is over here this morning. This is very interesting. Okay. I'm not going to forget about those of you over here, I promise. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so today's worship broadcast on WIOI is sponsored by the Carver, Rentro, Smalley, and McChesney families, and we are grateful for their sponsorship this morning. Um, if you look at the announcement pages in the bulletin, the last two pages, you'll see some notes about today's service, including that aside from celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is also Bach's birthday. And since it's been a big week for Bach here at Second Prez, um, including yesterday or Friday's performance of the St. John Passion, it seems only right that the prelude, offertory, and postlude also feature Bach's music as well. So hope that you like Bach because you're going to hear a lot of him today. Also during this service, we are going to celebrate communion. So if you are listening at home or watching online, this is about your 30 to 35 minute warning to have your bread and crackers or juice and wine and water ready to go. And for those of you who are here in the sanctuary with us, we will have servers that will bring the communion to you in the pews. So you can, we will come to you, you don't have to come to us. And because I like to cause a little chaos on big Sundays like this, I have decided that when it comes to communion, I want some help. But I don't want help from the grown-ups who are sitting in the front row. They have other things to do. But I'm hoping some of the kids who are here this morning would like to come down when we get to communion and meet me at the communion table, and you can help me tell the story of why we do communion. So you're what, sort of like the children's sermon, and I'm looking at you, Kendall, and, and the baby Jesus is in my office. I know where he is. I didn't forget him this time. He's where he's supposed to be. Um, but it's going to be like at Christmas time. So if you want to meet me at the communion table, uh, we will hear the story of why we do communion together. So we'll see how that goes. Um, following the service today, we will have an Easter egg hunt. I'm guessing maybe not outside because it's raining, probably down in, okay, Kelly's pointing down in the basement. So Kelly, why don't you wave your hands? So after the service, if you want to participate, young or small, uh, young or old, in the egg hunt, find Kelly and she will take you down there so that people don't just start running everywhere, <laughs> everywhere in the church. Um, so find her after the service. And then we're also having a special coffee hour in the parlor. So if you're not gonna hunt eggs, but if you'd like to come back and enjoy some Easter treats, it's going to be in the parlor. So if you go through those doors over there, directly across the hallway. Um, there are a lot of other announcements in the bulletin, but we have a lot of things packed into the service today. So I'm going to ask that hopefully you will read those announcements later on today. And if you have any questions about anything, that you please let us know, and we'll be glad to answer them for you. So with that, I think the last thing I want to say is that I'm really grateful that you're worshiping with us this morning, whether you're here in the building or at home or at work or in the car or wherever it is you are as you are um, a part of this service. And it is my prayer every time that we gather that God will come close to you in this time of worship and give you whatever it is you need this day. For this is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and to be glad in it. And now please join with me in the call to worship printed in the bulletin. People of God, we gather for worship to practice joy, not because our lives are perfect, but because joy is resilient. Joy is God's gift for every season and the wellspring at the heart of our faith. When our sins feel heavy, 
we practice joy. When floods rise and fall, we practice joy. When hope surprises us, we practice joy. When God sets people free, we practice joy. As we follow Jesus to the cross through an unsettled present, help us rejoice that we too will rejoice. As we come to this time of confession in the service, 
it is good to remember that the merciful one already knows everything we have to confess. It is by naming our sins and hearing the words of forgiveness that we are drawn into a deeper relationship with God and with each other, because we're confessing things together. So now let us bring before God what we have done wrong and what we have failed to do, trusting that we will receive the joy of being forgiven. Please join with me in the unison prayer of confession printed in the bulletin. God of abundant goodness, we have hurt those we love, our neighbors, ourselves, you and your creation by what we do and by what we neglect. We cling to disappointments, judgments, and failures and refuse to enjoy what you give. We are too content when injustice, violence, and hardship plague our neighbors. We ignore the gifts of your presence in times both tragic and triumphant. Forgive us for what we have done and for what we have failed to do. Forgive us and pour out on us the joy of your presence and heal what we have harmed. And now, my friends, receive these joyful words. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross, you are entirely and completely forgiven of all of your sins. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross, you are entirely and completely welcomed as God's beloved child. Through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross, you are liberated to live out God's love in a world that needs the joy of forgiveness and belovedness that is ours. So know that your sin is forgiven and be at peace. Please be seated. And let us pray. Speak to us through the reading and the proclamation of your word, holy God. Speak with authority in our lives. Speak to us with joy, with love, with hope, and with strength. Speak so that we might hear you and know that deep inside, we are your people, and you are our God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. During the season of Lent that has led up to this Easter Sunday, we've been talking about different kinds of joy in our worship services. We've talked about persistent joy, liberating joy, transformative joy, and vocational joy. And today's first scripture reading from Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9, provides us with yet another aspect or image of joy. So you might call this sort of the slow burn kind of joy, kind of like a crock pot, right? A crock pot cooks things low and slow, so it's crock pot joy. And Isaiah's words paint a picture of the kind of low and slow joy 
that often follows a period of long suffering. So in this case, in Isaiah, I was reading, uh, the low and slow joy looks like a great feast with the best food and drink on the menu. And so even as Isaiah talks about God swallowing up death, God sets a joyful feast for his people, an image we see reflected in the sacrament of communion. So these words are God's promises to us and for us. So hear what the Spirit is saying to this church about this low and slow kind of joy. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a rich feast of food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all Faces. And the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second scripture reading today is from the Gospel of John, verse, oops, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. And I think this provides another example of another kind of joy. And there's probably a couple of different examples of joy in this. Um, at one point, there's probably something you would call exuberant joy. Uh, maybe something like Easter Sunday always feels like a very glorious day. So maybe there's something like glorious joy in this reading. That sounds like the fancy kind of joy a pastor should talk about on Easter Sunday. But because I'm difficult and a little weird, I'm not going to talk about glorious joy. I'm going to talk about something different. I'm going to call it something different. I'm going to call it stealthy joy. I'm going to call it stealthy joy, which is sort of a cousin to the low and slow joy of the Isaiah reading, um, because in this story, joy sneaks up on Mary. So here again, what the Spirit is saying to you, the church. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. Just as a little side note, this is where the track and field portion of the Easter story begins, because there's a whole lot of running in the next couple of verses. So Mary ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went to the tomb. And the two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter, and he got there first, so I guess he won the race. So when they got to the tomb, he bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, which had been wrapped around Jesus' body. So he saw them, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came, running, slowly, apparently, following him, and he went into the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in. So now they're both in this empty tomb. And it says, he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples, it says, returned to their homes. But Mary, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting sitting right there where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And those two angels looked at her and they said, Woman, why are you crying? And she said, they, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now here comes a little spoiler alert. This is where the stealthy joy comes in. It sneaks right up on her when she's least expecting it. So she's there, she's talking to the angel, she's crying, and when she said this to the angel, she turns around, and what does she see? She sees Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. But he said to her, just like the angels had said to her, woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. And in that moment, I think there is pure joy. But he continues. He says, Do not hold on to me. Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. 
So Mary Magdalene went from the tomb and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So of all the kinds of joy that we have talked about in the last six weeks during the season of Lent, I think stealthy joy might be my favorite. Because I love it when I am surprised by joy. I love it when joy seems to come out of nowhere, when I'm least expecting it, and when it surprises me, just like it surprised Mary when she came face to face with Jesus outside of the empty tomb. Now, the tricky thing about reading words from a page is that we don't know exactly what her tone is or how loud her, the volume of her voice was when she recognizes Jesus and says, Rabuni, but I'd like to think it sounded a little bit like a whoop, right? Like a whoop of joy because her eyes have been opened and the thing that she thought was impossible has happened. So just think about it. She's been keeping vigil by this tomb for a while now. And she's gone and ran to the disciples, and they've come, and then they've left, and now she's still there. She's been sitting there desperately hoping that the reports of his death have been greatly exaggerated. And so it's likely that she is weighed down with grief and sorrow, and she's alone again because the disciples have deserted. She's alone in her misery And then all of a sudden, joy sneaks up on her and transforms her. So here's a question for you this morning. Do you remember the last time joy snuck up on you? Do you remember the last time joy snuck up on you? And here's another, in case you can't think of an answer to that one. Here's another question, because you know I love asking questions. When's the last time you shouted for joy about something that happened? For many of us, these are hard questions to answer. It might be hard to remember the last time we were surprised by joy or the last time we shouted for joy. And maybe that's something we should work on in the upcoming weeks. But in the meantime, If you want to see stealthy joy, particularly, happen in real time, like this John reading portrays the Easter morning discovery happening in real time with everyone running around, I want to recommend an old, old but viral YouTube video. It's from 2012, and it features a guy named Alexander Gom, G-A-M-M-E. And he is a Norwegian explorer slash adventurer. And so this video that you can look up um, is from day 86 of his three-month journey skiing from the edge of Antarctica to the South Pole and back again. That is 2,200 kilometers or about 1,400 miles. He has, at this point, day 86 of about a 90-day journey, he has lost 55 pounds from skiing 10 hours a day. And he is very hungry. (laughs) But he is not hungry for the good and nutritious foods that he's been eating that have enabled him to ski for 10 hours a day. He wants something delicious. He wants something pleasurable. So he's gone from the edge of Antarctica to the South Pole, and now he's retracing his steps back to where he started. And all along the way, he has dug and buried what he calls caches. So they're little packages full of food and gear and stuff that he's going to need for the return trip, but he doesn't want to carry with him the whole way. So in this video, on this 86th day, He films himself as he digs up the very last cache that he has buried for himself. He's about 200 kilometers from the finish line. And so he's kind of filming himself like this as he's picking things out of his bag. And first he finds like chapstick and zinc ointment, 
which are helpful things, but nothing that gets him very excited on day 86 of this journey. And then all of a sudden, I don't even know if you can see it in the video, but all of a sudden there's this exuberant shout of, yeah, which means yes in Norwegian. And again, he yells, yeah, and the camera gets all kind of wobbly because uh, he's so excited. And he's shouting with joy because this cache, which he has left for himself three months ago, but he hasn't kept track of what's in it at all, he finds bags of cheese doodles. <laughs> and he shouts for joy. And he throws the cheese doodles in the air, and he falls over into the snow laughing, kind of making a snow angel, I think. All of this experiencing this stealthy joy because he forgot that he buried those things there for himself all those days ago. So from the top of his dreadlocked head all the way down to his toes in the boots that are buried in the snow, he is just brimming over with joy. So for Alexander Gom, the Norwegian adventurer, and for Mary, joy is stealthy, and it sneaks up on them both when they least expected it. So to finish the connection that I'm trying to make, I will contend, I will argue this morning, that the joy of Jesus' resurrection, the joy of Easter Sunday, can be a stealthy joy. It snuck up on Mary and those first disciples, and it maybe still sneaks up on us today. The joy of Jesus rising from the dead and opening the gates to everlasting life for us by conquering death, it's there. It's waiting for us. Like one of the Norwegian adventurers, caches buried in the snow, joy is there in front of us, waiting for us to dig it up and to whoop with joy. And while I will admit that cheese doodles are very tasty, the joy of resurrection is life-giving and soul-sustaining. But there's something very curious about this story, and I just want to point that out to you. John says the disciples see and believe, even though they don't quite understand all that is happening. So believing and non-understanding are not mutually exclusive in the life of faith. Believing and not understanding can actually coexist. So maybe faith is sort of like a spectrum. And you can have faith but have not understanding and still be on the same place together. Maybe it's not one or the other. Maybe it can be both at the same time. And if it's true for the disciples, the same must be true for us. Belief can precede understanding, and belief can even coexist with not understanding. I find great comfort in that. The good news is that the stealthy joy of Jesus' resurrection doesn't wait for us to understand it. It doesn't wait for us to understand it completely before it begins to change our lives. Sometimes stealthy joy burns low and slow for a while like a crock pot, like that promise in Isaiah's vision. And in fact, I think, I would argue, that just by being a part of this worship service, we are being changed. We are being transformed by joy, low and slow. And the stealthy joy of the resurrection doesn't come to us because we've earned it. Mm -mm. It comes to us because we need it, not because we deserve it. It comes to us because the love of God in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the love of God in Jesus is relentless, and it is profound. And the love of God stealthily and unexpectedly 
breaks through the barrier between life and death to reach each one of us. So I submit to you this morning that sometimes joy is loud and exuberant, and sometimes it is stealthy. It comes in many surprising shapes and forms. Sometimes joy is an emotion, sometimes it's a conviction, sometimes it is a practice. And sometimes joy can hum quietly in the background. Sometimes joy will shout, yeah, on the edge of Antarctica. Joy, especially the joy of Jesus' resurrection, I think adapts to our circumstances. And it can even coexist with, maybe especially with, doubt and joy and sorrow and pain. You can have joy and doubt. You can have joy and not understand. But you could also have joy and hope and peace and love. So I guess if there's one thing I want you to remember when you leave today, more than anything else, I hope that you will think of joy as a beacon that points us toward God's unfailing presence. So if you persistently search for joy, as Mary did at the empty tomb, and Alexander wandering around in our Antarctica, if you search for joy, I think you undoubtedly will find God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the wild and uncontainable Holy Spirit. Amen.
Please join with me in the responsive affirmation of faith printed in the bulletin. Do you believe in God? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Ghost? I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we continue our worship with the time of offering, we remember that scripture says in Peter, as each has received a gift, employ it for one another as good stewards of God's varied grace that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So our giving connects our work with God's work. So may we give as those connected to God's great works of creation and redemption and belovedness. So will the ushers please come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. the adventure begins. If there are any kids that would like to come down and help me with the communion this morning, you are welcome to come now.
And you can stand all around here. And if you have to sneeze, please turn your head away from the bread and the cups. All right, here, you can come in the middle if you want. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. How are you? Happy Easter. Yeah, you're good. Okay. So today, I'm hoping that you will help me tell the story of why we celebrate communion. Can you help me with that? Maybe. Are you, Colton, will you try? Okay, good. Okay. So the very first time the church celebrated communion was the day before Jesus died. It was a Thursday. And the fancy name we give that day is Monday Thursday. It's a very sad day. It's kind of a happy day, but it was also kind of a sad day, too. So because Jesus knew he was going to die on the next day, so what day comes after Thursday? Friday, thank you. Okay, good. First question and answer. We did it right. Good job. Okay, so because Jesus knew he was going to die the next day on Friday, he invited some of his favorite people to come and have a special dinner with him on Thursday evening. And they called it the Last Supper because it was going to be the last time they had a meal together. So, question number two. He invited some friends to have supper with him. Uh, Do you remember how many friends he invited to that meal? Twelve, Colton says. Twelve is right. So, plus Jesus is thirteen. He's looking at me like, why are you even asking that question? Yes, I just wanted to be clear. Twelve plus Jesus. So, um, there's, a, there's a special name that we give to Jesus, this group of friends of Jesus. Um, it's, mm, do you know what it's called? We call them the disciples. That's right. Oh, this is going so well. I'm so excited. Okay, so there's the disciples, and there's how many of them? Okay, so it's the 12 disciples Jesus is having dinner with at the, what did they call this special meal the last time they ate together? The Last Supper. The Last Supper, you're right. Okay, good. Oh, this is going better than I was expecting. Okay, so let's turn the page. So at this Last Supper, he wanted to tell them that he was going to die tomorrow on what Friday, and he wanted to tell them that he loved them very much. Yes, but those can be hard things to tell someone, right? Sometimes it's easier to show someone first and then tell them. So this is what he showed them. After dinner, they were all gathered around the table, like you guys are gathered around the table with me, and there was a what sitting on the table? Loaf of bread. So if you've seen me do communion before, I do what Jesus did at that Last Supper, right? What does he do first? Fix it up, right? And he gives thanks to God for it, and then he breaks it. That's right. Okay. So, uh... Multiple choice. Choice A, did he then slather it up with butter and jam and eat the whole loaf himself, or B, did he share it? B, he shared it. You're right. Okay, so um, he passed the bread around the table, and once everyone had a piece, he said something like, when you eat this bread, remember I love you very much. Okay? Okay. So I'm going to hold this piece of bread, and I'm going to ask each one of you to tear a piece off and just hold on to it, okay? And as you tear it off, I'm going to say, remember, Jesus loves you very much, okay? All right, we'll start with Kendall. Remember, Jesus loves you very much. Remember, Jesus loves you very much. Maybe we should all say it together. Do you think we could all say it together? Remember, Jesus loves you very much. 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 Okay. All right. If you want to put your bread down on the communion table so you don't drop it, you can do that. I drop things when I try to hold on to them for such a long time. So, okay. So there was something else on the table. What? Yes. So there was a cup, and he poured some wine into it. But this is juice, just for the record. So I'm going to pour juice into the cup, just like Jesus did. And then do you think he just drank it all? No, what do you think he did? 
He shared it. So should I pass the cup around and have a... No, I'm not going to do that this morning. That's not usually the way we do things here. So instead, I'm going to give you one of these little cups, okay? And so as he was passing the big cup around as they were all taking a swig, what do you think he said to them each time? Something like, remember that I love you. A little bit? Very much, very much. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, so we're going to say it again. Remember that Jesus loves you very much as I give each person a cup, okay? Ready? Are you really ready? Okay, he says yes. Okay. Remember Jesus loves you very much. 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 I'm trying to go in order. Remember, Jesus loves you very much. Now, you can also put that down on the table because if you think bread is hard to hold on to, not spilling one of those cups is a hundred times harder than that. Okay, so this meal is called the Last Supper. So he broke the bread and he shared it with people and then he took the cup and shared it with people and each time he said something like, remember that I love you very much. And how many people were there? Plus Jesus, so 13, yes. And this happened on what day of the week? Okay, and then what was going to happen the next day? He was going to die. So he, wanted, he really wanted to make sure they knew that he loved them very much before he died. Because once he died, he wasn't going to see them again. And he wanted to give them a special way to remember and he loved them, especially when they missed him a lot. So that's why we call this special dinner the Last Supper with his friends, the how many? And what were their, the disciples, that's right. So ever since then, ever since that Thursday, ages and ages and ages and ages ago, on special occasions like Easter Sunday, we as a church gather and have Communion is what we call this. And it's time for us to remember that Jesus invites us to be his friends and to come to his table and eat the bread and drink from the cup. And so when we do that, we remember, what do we say? Remember very much. Yes. All right. I'd ask if you have questions, but we would probably be here for a while. So instead... I'm going to say you can take your cup and your bread and you can go back to your seats very carefully. And so what we're going to do next is everybody else is going to get bread and a cup and then we're going to save it so that we all have it. Good job. So when we all have it, we can take it all together. And when we do this, grown-ups and children alike, the most important part is that we remember when we eat from this bread and drink from this cup, we remember, oh, I'm going to call on everybody. When we do this, we will remember that what? Jesus loves us very much. Thank you. All right. Now, if you would join with me in the great prayer of thanksgiving that is printed in your bulletin, we will sing and say our way through the communion service today. So the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. You are holy God of wonders, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He came with healing in his touch, but was wounded for our sins. He came with mercy in his voice, but he was mocked and taunted. He came with peace in his heart, but was met with violence and death. And by your power, he broke free from the tomb. The one who was dead is now alive. The one who humbled himself is now lifted up as the Lord of all creation and the lamb upon the throne. So we join our voices with the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name.
feed us at this table where you invite your friends to join you. Help us to know Christ's love made real in his sacrifice for us, in the breaking of the bread and the pouring of the cup. Help us to remember, especially during communion, that you love us very much. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming again. Send your wild and uncontainable Holy Spirit upon us and these elements that they may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Great is the mystery of faith. Risen Lord, come and find us. Meet us right where we are. Speak our names in such a way that we will one day understand the resurrection to new life in a new way. Make us now your presence known to us, among us, this morning as we gather at your table. Whether we are here in the building or worshiping from home or at work or the car or wherever we are. Help us to see that this is no ordinary bread and no ordinary cup, but turn them into something extraordinary, a meal that is meant to nourish and guide us into complete holiness. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. As we celebrate communion today, the servers will bring you the bread first, and you just take a piece off of the tray and then pass it along to the person nearest to you, and hold on to it until we have all been served so that we will eat together. And we'll do the same with the cup, which as I said earlier, is filled with grape juice this morning. So remember, every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. And it reminds us that he loves us very much.
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And so as you take this piece of bread, remember that this is Christ's body broken for you and that Jesus loves you very much. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. And so as you take this cup, remember that this is Christ's blood shed for you and that Jesus loves you very much. And let us pray. Loving God, you have given all to us and for us. And to you, Lord, we return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give us only your love and your grace, for that is enough for us. There is joy overflowing in our world because you have come, feeding us lovingly with bread and cup. And now as this service ends, you are sending us out into the world. And so as we go, send us out with the power of Christ's humility to heal the sharp and jagged world in which we live. 
We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Before we get to the benediction this morning, I have one more example of stealthy joy, which again is my favorite kind of joy. <clears throat> I also really love giving presents. So in the spirit of Alexander Gom's stealthy cheese doodle joy, <coughs> what do you think's in here, Susie? I have, oops, I have some cheese doodles here that I'm going to hand back to the choir. Mike, I'm going to hand them to you, but don't let anybody eat them until after the service. 
or he says they're not getting past him. He's going to keep them all for himself. So, and deacons in the back row, if you look under your pew, there's a cardboard box that has cheese doodles in the back. So if you're going out those doors, you can get cheese doodles. And there's a box under the pew there, and I'll get those out as soon as the service is over, too. So, um, may this forever be known as the Stealthy Joy Cheese Doodles Easter Sunday. (laughs) Alleluia, amen. Okay, now join with me in the benediction that is printed in the bulletin. It was early in the morning, still dark. The dawn was just starting to cut through the fog. The air hung heavy with expectation, as if the earth itself was holding its breath. The echoes on the cross of Friday linger. It is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. The story comes in bits and pieces, hints and images. A stone rolled away, a pile of clothes folded in the tomb. Mary Magdalene running for the disciples with the news that Jesus has disappeared. While the disciples walk away, shoulders slumped, Mary remains weeping and we weep with her. There is so much loss, so much grief, so much death. What she doesn't know is that Jesus is right there in front of her. God comes to us in the things of this world, but often we don't have eyes to see. Today, Jesus is looking at you and speaks your name. What the angels said is true. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive, and that means love has won. Death is finished. Evil is conquered. And God is good. So go now in joy to love and serve the Lord in the name of the Father and the Son and the wild and uncontainable Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.